Hello, I'm Dr. Keon West from the Institute of Psychological Sciences at the University of Leeds, and I'm here to talk to you about the importance of statistics. It's very rare that statistics happens to be anyone's favorite part of studying psychology, or any other science for that matter. Statistics can be complicated, they can be confusing, they can be difficult, and often they're just not that interesting, at least not for many of our students. But statistics are still very important, and I'm going to try and explain to you why they're very important and why they're in fact essential to conducting this kind of scientific investigation. Suppose you had a question, any kind of question would do. Let's say that you wanted to know whether or not men were taller than women. How would you go about figuring that out? Now, the immediate thing would be to say, well, I could go out and measure the height of a man and then measure the height of a woman and see if the man is taller than the woman. And if that works, then you could say that men are taller than women, right? Well, no, wrong. Because there's many reasons why that's a very bad way of handling it. You could measure a particularly tall man and a particularly short woman. So you could, in this instance, find that one man is taller than one woman. But if you had measured two other randomly selected people, it's possible that you would have found that the woman was taller than the man. And then you'd have a different result. OK, then you'd say, what do we do in this case? Maybe we should measure multiple people. You could go around measuring groups of men and groups of women, and then you could compare them. But how would you do that? Would you tick a box every time a man was taller than a woman and tick another every time a woman was taller than a man? And then I guarantee you, even if you went through a very rigorous system of measuring people, if you gather any two groups of people together, even randomly selected, you will find that their heights are different because human beings vary in height. And so what you need to know is, is this difference in height a real difference or just an illusory random difference that happens to crop up? Let's say you had another question. Do students who study more do better at exams? We're not assuming any direction. We're just looking. Do students who study more do better at exams? How would you check that? You could find one student, and you could say, well, this student, she studies very hard, but she doesn't do particularly well. And maybe you find another random student, and he studies very little, but he does very well at his exams. Should you then conclude that, well, clearly studying actually doesn't do much for your exams or doesn't make much of a difference? Well, of course you can't, because if you had selected two other students quite at random, then you might have found that actually this student studies very little and does very poorly, and the other student, why well, she studies a lot and does very well. But even then, we're not sure. We can't tell if this is random or if it's fluctuating or if it's a real thing that actually is emerging from the data. You could measure a bunch of people, a number of students, but how many would be enough? And how much of a relationship would be enough? You could plot them on a graph, as I've done, and you would see that the students are moving from those who study very little and get very bad grades to those who study very much and get very good grades. So it looks like something is going on. But at what point can we declare that, yes, we've decided this is a real relationship and not just something that looks like a relationship? I'll ask you two more questions that are a bit more complicated and not as easily visually represented. One would be, how would you check whether exercise predicted exam results? This is not just whether there's a relationship between exercising and getting good grades. This is whether one variable predicts the other or explains the variance in the other. Or an even more complicated question, what if you wanted to know how exercising and going to parties influence exam results together? That's a bit of a tricky one to visualize, because it could just be that exercise predicts better grades and partying predicts better grades. Or they could interact with each other in some way, so that one predicts more, one predicts less, and that they balance each other out in some places and actually make each other stronger in other places. This is a very complicated question, and it's not that straightforward to get it into our heads, and it's definitely not that straightforward to check by simply putting data points on a graph. So if you have all these questions, you have some very specific questions about the data that you need to have answered before you can decide whether or not any of these relationships are real and whether or not any of these relationships are meaningful. You have questions like, how many data points do you need? At what point do you stop thinking it's just a fluke or a random fluctuation and decide that it's an actual, stable difference that's emerging in the data? And how can you measure whether or not relationships between variables are strong or weak and whether they go in one direction or in another direction? And if you understand the importance of getting these answers from the data, then you've understood the importance of statistics. Because statistics is how we answer these questions. Statistics allow us to decide whether measured differences are meaningful, or whether they're just due to chance or the way we measured it. Statistics help us to decide whether relationships are real, or whether these relationships are just illusory. 
They help us decide whether one variable predicts another, or whether it's smarter to say that the relationship goes in the other direction. And they also help us decide how multiple variables predict each other at once. This gets increasingly complicated as you go up the levels, but I will run through two examples to help us understand what we're doing with statistics and how psychologists in particular choose which relationships to look at and which ones to decide were just due to chance. So let's go back to our original question. Are men generally taller than women? We know that not all men are taller than all women. We know that some women are taller than some men. But we can measure overall the height of men and women. The way that we do this is probably something you would recognize from taking classes earlier in high school or at A-levels. You'd calculate the mean of the height of the men and the height of the women. That's incredibly straightforward. To get the mean height of men, you simply add together all the heights of the men, and you divide it by the number of men that you counted. To do the same thing with the women, to get the mean for the women's height, you add together all of the heights of the women, divide that by the number of women that you measured. Now that's very straightforward. But as I said earlier, if you get any two random groups of people, even if both of these groups are composed of men or both are composed of women, there will be a difference in their heights because of the normal fluctuations. So there will be a difference in the means as well. How then do you decide whether this difference in means is a meaningful difference in the means? To do that, because we're taking two independent samples, psychologists would probably use an independent samples t-test. This is a test specifically designed to test whether means are different between independent groups, two independent groups. You can see the formula for the t-test on the slide. It involves subtracting the mean height of one from the mean height of the other. So in this case, we could say hypothetically, subtract the mean height of the men from the mean height of the women, or subtract the mean height of the women from the mean height of the men. And then you put all of that over the standard deviation of the two groups. Now, why measure the standard deviation? What is it? The standard deviation is a measurement of how much these heights vary around the mean. So it's a measurement of the variance within the groups. And you always divide the variance between the groups, which is what we have on the top, with the variance within the groups, which is what we have on the bottom. And in general, if you find that the variance between the groups is large, and the variance within the groups is small, then you say that you have a meaningful difference. But we're still not done. We have a t value, and that's a good value. Now we have a good idea of whether or not this variance means something. But we still don't have a cutoff point. We still have no way of deciding this much is significant for us, and this much is not significant for us. This much we'll ignore. Psychologists have chosen a point, and in order to get to that point, you need to calculate the p-value, or to find the p-value. That's relatively easy to do, and there are tables that convert t-values to p-values, and other values to p-values as well. They're easy to find. All you have to do is take the t-value and find the corresponding p-value. And once you do that, then you can decide, is it significant or is it not significant? Psychologists have chosen a cutoff point. For us, the cutoff point is p equals 0 0.05. To understand the meaning of that point, you need to understand what the p-value actually represents. The p-value represents the likelihood of finding that difference if, in fact, there were no real differences. If it was just by chance and you measured two groups randomly, how often would you find a difference that was that big? How often would you find that the variance between was bigger than the variance within to that extent. We've chosen 1 in 20, or 0 0.05, as our cutoff point. Now, we know that's not perfect, and we know it's a bit arbitrary. Maybe something that would only happen once every 19 times would still be interesting, and we account for that. And something that would only happen once every 10,000 times is clearly much more interesting to people. But it's still a point, and we had to pick one. So we went for p equals 0 0.05. If then, having calculated the means, and the t-value, and the p-value, you then find that there's a reasonable difference between the heights of the men and the women, and that that p-value is smaller than 0 0.05. At that point, as a psychologist, you would say, we've concluded that in this study, at least, the men were taller than the women. Let's try another one. Do students who study more do better at exams? This time, we have to calculate a different statistic, because we're not trying to figure out if the differences are bigger between the groups than within the groups. This time, we're trying to figure out if variables co-vary, if they travel together, if an increase in one corresponds to an increase in the other, or if, by contrast, an increase in one corresponds to a decrease in the other. In this, we're assuming that an increase in one corresponds to an increase in the other, that studying 
and getting good exam grades go together. And we can see the relationship graphically. But to calculate it, we need to calculate what we call the Pearson's R. This formula that I've shown is a bit of a simplified formula for it. It's simplified specifically in that we're assuming that we're using populations rather than samples. But that's fine, because it still gives the measure, or still gives the overall idea of what it is that we're doing. We're measuring the covariance at the top. That's the covariance of x and y, x being one variable and the other variable, let's say studying and exam grades. And underneath them, we have the standard deviations of x and y, the way that they deviate from their particular means. So what we're looking at, again, is the variance between them. We're looking at how much they vary together and the variance within them, how much they vary individually, whether they just vary. And if that white noise at the bottom is bigger than the covariance at the top, we say it's not a meaningful relationship. But if the covariance at the top is bigger than the white noise at the bottom, then we say it is a meaningful relationship. And again, as with the t-value, you need to then translate that r-score into a p-score. And if that p-score is less than 0.05, you can say this is a meaningful relationship. Furthermore, if you have an r-score, the bigger the r-score, the stronger you know the correlation is. Correlations can only vary between 1 and negative 1. 0 meaning no correlation at all, 1 meaning a perfect positive correlation, meaning that as one goes up, the other one goes up exactly as it goes up, a negative 1 being a perfect negative correlation. As one goes up, the other goes down in exactly the same kind of way. So that's how you calculate whether or not one variable is related to another variable. The other two questions, I'm not going to go into the specific statistics of them, because these statistics get a bit longer and much more complicated. But it's the same basic idea. You measure the variance that happens between, and you divide it by the variance that happens within. And if you want to calculate a regression weight, you're looking at whether exercise, for example, predicts exam results. Then you specifically look at the weight, the regression weight, of one variable predicting the other. You look at the p-value, you decide if it's significant, and then you look at what we'd call the beta to decide how strong that relationship is. For the other one, the much more complicated question, how do exercise and parties together predict exam results? in which one could be going up and the other could be going down and they could be interacting, we have to do an analysis of variance, which is insanely more complicated but adds up to more or less the same thing. And this will allow us to see whether both have positive effects, whether both have negative effects, whether one only has a positive effect when the other one isn't taken into account. That's what we call an interaction. This gets really interesting, and for us, it's kind of exciting. And this is how statistics help us figure out any number of variables. In another way that I won't even put up on a slide, because it's much more complicated, it's called structural equation modeling, we can simultaneously calculate the relationships between many different variables at once. You can have tens or hundreds, if you're particularly crazy, of variables. In one particular equation, you put them all together, you could see, does this predict that while that one is predicting this? We think that's cool. Hopefully you do too. But it's the way that you can figure out whether exercising and studying and partying and drinking and the number of friends that you have all predict your exam results. And whether exam results and the ownership of a car and the number of parties you go to and the amount that you exercise predict how happy you feel. And you can do that all at once using this one particularly large set of equations. So that's really fun. So the take home message for statistics is if you have a question and if you have data, then we have a formula that can help you answer that question using that data. Statistics can be difficult, they can be confusing, and they can be complicated. But statistics allow us to measure the relationships between multiple variables to decide whether or not those relationships are real or illusory and to decide how strong or how important those relationships are. And with that, thank you very much. I'm Dr. Keon West from the Institute of Psychological Sciences at the University of Leeds. That was the importance of statistics.